I'm uh, Jeff Washburn, uh, serve as the administrator for the Minnesota CLT Coalition for the last three months. Prior to that, was uh, with the City of Lakes Community Land Trust for 20 years. Um, and so, session is seller leveraged opportunities. And uh, I think before, just to kind of start off, um, you know, a little bit over three years ago, uh, Memorial Day weekend, George Floyd was killed eight blocks from where I live. Uh, and we had civil unrest after that, and, and uh, the city of Minneapolis was going through a, a crap ton of turmoil, uh, and we're still kind of working through that. One of the things that happened um, following that is that there was, a, there was a bit of a reconciliation, I think, going on by a lot of residents in the city. Uh, the city was trying to figure out how they were going to respond, and I think we, we still are, as a city, trying to to figure a way, ideally, to be a better city. But I think a lot of individuals said, I'm not waiting around for the city. I, there's something I can do on my own level. And uh, you know, that summer, um, we just started getting inquiries, emails, phone calls. And hey, I, I, I think we can do better. And I made a bunch of money. I bought my home in 2010, 2011. I made a bunch of money on my home. And, and I think I can sell it. And I want, I want to sell it to the land trust. I'm even willing to take a, a haircut on my home. Uh, a lot of the conversations, and where I, where I kind of tie this back directly to George Floyd, is a lot of folks would say, and I'd love it, if at all possible, if you can make sure that this gets sold to an African-American household. Uh, we maybe had one or two of these inquiry calls before then, previous 17 years of working at the City of Lakes Community Land Trust. But it, it literally was on a weekly basis that we were getting some sort of a, an inquiry there for a while, and at very least, uh, before I left, you know, one to two a month of these inquiries. Um, and so it, it forced us, I think, at the, the City of Lakes Community Land Trust to, to say, hey, we, you know, there's, there's an opportunity here in, in creating more permanently affordable homes through this, this opportunity. Um, and so how do we start to do that? So the basis of everything I'm going to share today is really somewhat recent in that history. Um, from my understanding, it still is, you know, happening for the City of Lakes Community Land Trust. But as I have more conversations with other land trusts, I think it's not that uncommon of an occurrence for somebody to say, I want to sell my home to the land trust. Can it be part of the land trust when they go to sell? Within that, I think, you know, I think there's some opportunities to build in additional affordability or development to that conversation. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping to talk through and kind of the methodology behind what we created. By no means is it a science. Um, and I think it can be built on and improved and we can take those stories and, and do something with it. Uh, but this is a starting point, so that, that's where this conversation hopefully will go, and, and maybe we can brainstorm even better solutions as we move forward. So we're going to talk about uh, why the opportunities exist. I shared a little bit about the Minneapolis experience. What do we mean by seller leveraged opportunities? Uh, I got two bullet points there. Whoops. Different ways properties can be discounted to uh, or donated. Past experiences. How to operationalize a program like this. What are the best practices? How to market it? Uh, what are the benefits? What are the downsides? And then, then lessons learned uh, that hoping to be able to share with, with everybody. <laughs> so what do we mean by seller leveraged opportunities? Essentially, just the CLT purchasing or receiving a property for value below market value, uh, I'll call it appraised value. Um, and this discounted or, or donated value that then can be counted as leverage with other funding sources uh, and, and can be used to create uh, a, you know, a, an affordable unit through the land trust. Uh, and then that, that, that discounted or donated benefit can be realized by the, the beneficiary, well not the beneficiary, but the, 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 the donator or the seller of the discounted property uh, to the land trust. So why do they exist? At least for the land trust, I think we are all in a space where we have to be scrappier in how we bring homes into our trust. The days of going out and building new construction, <laughs> raising two, three hundred thousand dollars to create a one single home is is tough. And so, you know, ACK rehab is a way to do it. Buyer driven program is another way to do it. Um, but I think increasingly we're going to have to be scrappy in the ways that we bring homes into our community land trust because it's 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 just expensive, and I'm I'm preaching to the choir there on that front. Uh, the affordable housing system is broken, and more of the general public is recognizing that. And by that I mean, you know, 
there, there, there are very few conversations that any of us can have, and we're all in the industry, but I think even on the street, people talking about how expensive housing is, the whole continuum. I first moved to Minneapolis in 1996. There might have been one or two folks uh, living in a tent. Uh, and if you, if you drive around Minneapolis, it's, it's almost on a block basis now. There's more and more people who are struggling with shelter. Talk about expensive rents, there's, there's another level there of you know, people not thinking anything of dropping $2,000 now for a two or three bedroom or rental in, in Minneapolis. And then home ownership, I think. <coughs> Sorry, uh, should not have had the peanuts for, for, for a break. Um, home ownership, I think, is increasingly out of touch for folks. Uh, back in, in 2002, we could help somebody into home ownership with a with a land trust for a thirty thousand dollar investment. That same program now we're investing up to one hundred twenty thousand dollars in just 20, 20 years difference, and so it's just getting more and more expensive to bridge the difference between households what they make in income, what they can get in a mortgage, and what they what they can buy. We all we all know this. Um, some people, as I shared in the story previously, want to do their part in in economic or racial equity work. Uh, some homeowners just want to leave a legacy, right? If, Single person, have no kids, lived in the home, really don't have any beneficiaries. This is a great way to, to kind of work with a community organization to say, I want to leave something behind um, as a legacy to the community. It's potentially a lot quicker, as, as I'll talk through uh, the work that we've done in this space, thanks, um, is um, you, can, you can structure in a way that is very, very beneficial to the seller or the donator of the property. And there's the tax benefit, which we'll talk about. And then as I shared earlier, just just being responsive and, and trying to take advantage of, of scrappier opportunities. So I think I took this document several years ago. Um, the Twin Cities Habitat Affiliate has something up on their website that talks about the ways that people can donate property to Twin Cities Habitat. And is anybody from Twin Cities Habitat here? Nope, all right, good. Well, good and bad. Um, but they're just animals, right? Like everybody knows the habitat name. And you know they put it out there. Donate your car. Donate your house. Donate your you know, third kid. Like they will take it and and be able to monetize it and create affordable housing. Out of it. It's just a, a, an absolute affordable housing machine. But one of the things that they did have was you know different ways that people can donate to Habitat. And so I think a lot of these things are good things that all of our organizations should have out there as a tool and just letting people know that if they really like your organization, there's other ways that they can contribute to, the, to, to your community land trust. So clearly a direct donation of home or vacant parcel, somebody just wants to sign over the title to you, that's a, that's a, that's a great opportunity and you can start and you can do something with that, right? As an administrator of a land trust, yeah, I can work with that. Somebody's giving me a lot. Um, that's a good starting place. Discounted sale, and that's what we're gonna be talking a lot about here in this session. But there's also a retained life estate. Uh, so they, they donate, um, transfer ownership to the land trust, but you have some sort of a, a rent back agreement where they can stay in the property as long as they want. But at the end of the day, it's going to be it's going to be part of the, the, the community land trust. A bequest, um, donor leaves the land trust. I left CLCLT here in, in the document. Uh, they leave the land trust in their well to, to a homeowner. I think one of the things that I would like to add to this is a lot of those conversations, people can't leave all of the proceeds of their property to you, but you can build into a will, and, and we'll see when this plays out, but had several conversations over the years with, with folks that, that, that approached the City of Lakes Community Land Trust to say, hey, I, I, can't, I can't give you 100% of my proceeds. I wanna be able to give my kid $50,000 or whatever, but I'm willing to, I wanna leave something. And so knowing what we do about appreciation, what I know a number of homeowners have done is they've left the City of Lakes Community Land Trust, has been named in their wills, and what it's done is essentially provided a, um, a purchase option. Now, I don't know what the percent is, but maybe it's 50%. So what they've put in their will is that uh, the City of Lakes Community Land Trust will have first rights of purchase, uh, and they're able to purchase the property at 50%, for example, of the future appraised value of the property at passing of the individual. But that's still something that, that an organization can work with. In, in, you know, a lot of us may not even be around, but my hope would be that that future employee is gonna get this call one day by, from some attorney that says, yeah, you've been named in the will, you don't get the property, but you have an option to, to, to purchase it within the next 45 days for 50% of the current appraised value. 
So creating those kinds of opportunities to capture real estate, to create affordability through a discounted purchase, I think is huge. Um, and then option bequest, um, make sure I Oh, just a, a future option to be able to purchase the property at a future point in time, and then a life income gift. Uh, you know, so maybe the, the property is transferred to a trust, and that trust is able to make payouts to the community land trust at some point in time in the future. Are all different ways that you can think about real estate in that donation of property. So over the past two years, um, City Lakes Community Land Trust realized over six of these seller leveraged opportunities. As I shared, we're getting a lot of calls and interest um, in those early days, but it still is happening. Um, we were able, as we saw this happening, we realized that there still by, might be gaps that need to be realized. And so we started to go out and try and raise dollars, either an additional affordability gap or development gap, and, and raise these funds in a way that we could create a bucket of funds that we could, we could, we could apply at these opportunities to make them work and transition to an ownership opportunity. Uh, all of them were acquisition rehab. Some of them required very little, if any, rehab. Uh, some of them required quite a bit of rehab. Um, the reasons vary, but the common theme was wanting to do better for the Minneapolis community uh, and low-income buyers priced out of the market. Um, two of them came from nonprofit partners who had, they had rental uh, properties, single-family rental. It just wasn't working, or they were part of a larger tax credit deal. And as that tax credit came or they wanted to refinance a whole package, they realized that that property didn't make sense and they were willing to work with the City Lakes Community Land Trust to sell it at a discount to us or what they had into it, you know, or who they had financing to. Our bare bottom line, kind of as we were thinking this thing through, was that in the initial conversation, I'll go into a lot more detail about the, kind of the nuances of this, but was to always ask for at least the lead out conversation we will do this, but we want you to consider at least making a 20% reduction off the current appraised value in the sale to the land trust. And I think this is a really important thing. And I don't know if 20% is the right figure. It felt like the right figure, and it felt like something that, that folks could digest, but that's what we put on the table. Um, but on average, after all these things worked through, we saw actually an average of 41% reduction off the appraised value. So we started at 20 the net of that was that we had conversations where folks could give a lot more than 20%. And so, you know, on average, we were paying $60,000 on a $100,000 home. So it's meaning that in those situations, the, the owner was coming to you saying, I want to sell you, but maybe at market rate? Yep. We said, we would love, we think your home would be great for the land trust, but we're asking you to give up at least 20% of, of the value. And that's going to be our starting point for conversation. And I think in most cases, folks didn't hang up on me, right? Like they were saying, all right, tell me a little bit more. And I think there's some, you start by saying, look, if you're going to list this thing, you're probably going to be paying 6% in real, realtor fees. So really what we're asking for is a 14% reduction. Let's have that conversation. What do you think your home's worth? You start doing the math with them. You think, how much do you owe in the home? Like it's, you start to get into the details of somebody's life. And if somebody just... <laughs> They're underwater or they, they owe what, what it's valued, then thank you. Maybe we can work with you on our, our, our buyer-driven program to align a buyer that we're working with with the purchase of your home. But we can't just come out and buy it because there's going to be better opportunities because we have other people who are willing to sell us their homes at a discount. We're going to focus on them. There's another question? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how we got to closer to 40% on some of those because we said, look, I, I absolutely love that you're willing to discount your three hundred thousand or your four hundred thousand dollar house um, by by twenty percent, but that still only gets us to three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. And most of our buyers are getting mortgages for one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So we still have a huge gap there. Can you go deeper? We're raising some other dollars. We can bring in another fifty, but we still got another sixty thousand dollar gap. Can you go lower? Can you go lower? I mean, it turns into almost like this reverse auction thing going off to see if we can make the deal work. How much can they, how much can they weather in proceeds? Um, how much do they want this to be a permanently affordable home? How much can we bring to the table? How much can we convince funders to fill our pot so we can sweeten the deal? Because somebody, average citizen, the private market is willing to do, don't, 
discount their home by $80,000. If we can't take advantage of this, then we're not walking the talk, state of Minnesota, city of Minneapolis, whoever. How do we help fill this bucket so we can leverage this and create an ownership opportunity in a part of town that is now cost prohibitive to us as well as thousands of buyers in the city? I mean, that, that's the conversation that happens. Yeah. I think we... Was it, the first, the, our first session, I think I, I made that comment, like, you can solve pretty much anything with money in this industry, right, in the work that we're doing. So if there's an $800,000 property and we can get that price down, point, the land trust price point down to 150000 and we can leverage a lot of it from the private market, I'm going to fight like a dog to see that happen because 20 years from now, that $800,000 home is going to be worth $1.5 million, right? Like... Let's have that conversation. Maybe there is a limit, but I've seen crazy things over the years, and it's worth a try, right? All right. So how do you operationalize one of these things? I don't know. So it's good. I think good practice, lesson number one, is have a really good one-pager on what your organization does. It talks about you, the value you bring to the community, who you're serving, whatever it is at point in time and constantly update that booger, right? Like, things are always changing and you need to make sure that you have a living document that you're constantly putting into PDF format and anybody says, can you send me a little bit of something about your organization? You have it at the ready and it's not two or three years dated. So always have that in place. You need that and then you need to be able to have a program document, which I didn't have, but I created one for this session that I think we all should be using that, that gives an idea about what the process should look like to a potential um, you know, uh, donator or seller of a discount property to you. You're gonna have to order a CMA or BPO if, if you wanna establish value to have this conversation. I, uh, written verification, verbal, that someone could hypothetically uh, eat 20% of the value of their property in a discount sale to you. Uh, you then schedule a walk through the property, develop a performa, adjust, Communicate requested donation figures. I'm going to share, I'm going to go into more detail this next, this next slide. So I'm just providing an overview of kind of the high points of what I think it's take, taken to do this stuff. And there's a whole bunch of nuances in the conversation. But I do have, I may have more than, yeah. So we're going to get, yeah, the best case scenario for the seller, if they want any sort of tax benefit, is to sell it to the nonprofit. Yeah, do that one after the fact. You need to have, sure. have that. You need to have the cash. Yeah, you should have the cash to make this work. <laughs> you could always match up a seller and a buyer if the seller doesn't need the tax benefit. The only way they're going to, get, they're going to receive the tax benefit is to have a, a dual transaction. I actually asked my attorney about this question. He, he thought there was a way to do uh, oh. double closing. So if the parties come to the closing and there's actually like, the, they they get their tax benefit for the first closing to the CLP and at the same instance, the CLP then transfers just the house to the buyer. So talk to an attorney about a creative solution if you have But there's still there's still two transactions. Yeah, it's right. two transactions. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. Without money, potentially, basically. Quick question. Yep. Is this lovely handout um, going to be available as a part of the class? Like, yep, I'm a, this will be uploaded to, I think I'm going to go with the Google Docs next week. I'm going to try and put, it, put that out to everybody who's attended here, and that will be part of this folder from this program. Thank you so much. Thank so you. it's spelled out. Hopefully, thank you, Justin, for sh sharing these. Is there enough for everybody? One left. Oh, awesome. Good. Oh, Good. Sam. <laughs> All right, so that, I mean, steal Sam's for the time being. Because I can't read this slide, neither can anybody else. But I brought it up there to say this would be something if you looked at the PowerPoint in a future time and said, ah, oh, the knucklehead also shared something with us and looked for this document that's going to be in here. So I lay it out in a lot more detail here. So it was a conversation, right? Like, treat 
this, like a foundation called you and said, ah, we're thinking about giving you some money. Let's tell me a little bit about what you're doing. This is a total car sales job <laughs> in a very positive way to a potential donator to your organization. And so you gotta sell your benefits. You have to spend time, you have to talk about the land trust. When you're, <laughs> you're working on something really important, you have a deadline, in 15 minutes, you gotta get this email out, this person calls, you gotta take the time to massage this relationship and spend the half, the painful half hour after the 5,000th time explaining how the land trust works. <laughs> you need to do it one more time and you need to do it the best way ever because you're starting to build rapport with this person you care about their kids, you care about their pets, you're, like, you're going deep with folks, and I think that's how you have to treat this stuff, because ultimately, this could result in a fifty, eighty, hundred thousand dollar donation to your organization. I also think, it, and it's no disrespect to any of my other colleagues at the office, but if they're looking to make a huge, a huge donation, they want to talk to the, the person in charge. I don't know any more than, I, than any of my other colleagues at the City Lakes Community Land Trust, but that person wants to talk to the person who's calling the shots, and who's the leader of the organization. And so you really have to treat it like a big donor. And it may not pan out, and that's the time investment. If there's gonna be downsides to this, is that you're investing organizational capacity, your time to make this thing happen. But I think it's a tool that all of us should have in our toolbox because you never know when you, you're gonna yield a good opportunity. You never know who has and who has and doesn't have money in your community. You don't know who inherited, they may not make much fun of money now, but their parents may have left their, their, their home and they have 100% equity in a six or $700,000 home and they're, they're, they're willing to, yeah. to, to make a donation to you. Uh, you just don't know. So it's a conversation. First put forward, Char's sitting, or she was. Yeah, Char's sure, in the back room. So Char would often get these info at clclt.org. Hi, I'm thinking about selling my home or donating my home to the land trust, who should I talk to then? So I would pour that email onto me and I would say, hey, do you have a phone number? I'd like to give you a call. And I'm not gonna do this over, the, over, over an email, right? Like, so shoot them an email. If they didn't provide a number, typically they provide a number. Can you give me a call when you get a chance? Make a point, not wait two days, not wait three days. I gotta carve out some time within 24 hours of receiving that thing to give them a call and say, hey, I need to, love to have a conversation. Can we set up a time to talk? If they can't come around and start that conversation with them then, um, give them my cell phone, right? Like do all kinds of stuff because you want to make it as easy as possible. I don't know if they're, yeah, no disrespect to Habitat. I don't know if they're having the same conversation with Habitat. So I want to be the one that they're, <clears throat> that's getting back to them first. We want this opportunity. Uh, it's, you know, as simple as that. And then within that, Share with them all of these bullet points in this conversation. Here, sir, madam, yeah, this sounds great, but we're gonna, you think you could weather a 20% discount, at least a 20% discount. Uh, what's the process that you have to go through? So making sure that I, I touch on each of these points. We'll pay for the appraisal. We'll pay for the CMA. Uh, will you allow us to come in and check out your property? Tell me a little bit about it. And then this is the painful thing. We all do this. Like, they painted the, the kid's bedroom four years ago in the most perfect color. You have to weather all of these conversations. We've been doing this long enough, but we don't care about who's done what to their home. We want to create an affordable house, but you got to listen to everything. <laughs> and you have to listen hard because you might go through your inspection and say, well, that's going to go out of here. But if you know that they love a certain part of their home, you don't want to say that while you're walking through their home either. So you, you have to be really sensitive and listen to this conversation because there might be things that make no sense from a rehab perspective that you may need to take on and you need to be thinking about what you're gonna say if you're walking through their home at a future time with an inspector, you know, because these are valuable things to them, um, but it may not make sense for, for our, our future land trust property. Uh, let them know that you'll pay for the appraisal. Uh, here in Minneapolis, we have to do this thing called uh, Truth and Sale of Housing, which is essentially a, a seller finance inspection. They do a report, it's put on the website when you go to sell your home, all this information is provided, so there's a bunch of dings and issues with the home. Uh, certain things have to be taken care of uh, by time of closing or the buyer needs to accept that they'll do those things during the next 90 days or something like that. So there's an added step in Minneapolis. Some communities have similar types of mechanisms, but that's something that we talk about in Minneapolis. And then 
and let them know that um, you know, when we get through all these things, we'd write up the purchase agreement. Um, fortunately for us, is we, we had a, a real estate LLC. Uh, Osborne, back in the room, was the, was the realtor broker for that LLC. And Osborne graciously saw the bigger picture and said, yeah, I'll write up your stupid purchase agreement for this property, <laughs> but you all need to make sure that I'm the listing agent when we go to sell this property. So he would do that work pro bono, essentially, help us through this process, knowing that once we got to the other side, rehab it if necessary, he would get the full listing prop of the property and we'd be able to pay him the full, the full commission through the, the real estate company. So I think there's a key is essential, you know, kind of component there and making sure that you have a realtor who's willing to work with you. You don't have to have your own real estate company, but you need to at least have one or more realtors that are willing to do this work for you uh, on the front end, knowing that they're gonna get the listing agreement on the back end, right? Uh, let them know. As long as we walk through and we're able to see what needs to be done with the property, there'll be no, no inspection contingency. We'll assume all the repairs. We can, we can buy and close whenever it's convenient to you. So yes, you need cash to be able to do that, or at least financing lined up to act quickly. Um, both the owner and the CLT, you know, ideally, there were a couple of times where I think we agreed to pay um, their closing costs. Um, there might have been an assessment or two, but I mean, we've agreed to do those things, but ideally, you want to go into that like you do most transactions. Seller's going to take care of their stuff. Buyer, we're going to take care of our stuff at closing. And then we will take care of and complete and gain the signatures for the IRS forms. And I'm going to talk about that stuff too. Then typically what we do, we got beyond that first conversation. They're like, yeah, in theory, in theory we can go along with this. Let's see where it shakes out. What we're going to do is order a CMA, compared to market analysis or a brokered price opinion to establish at least a ballpark figure. And oftentimes when I'm having this initial conversation, oh, what's your address? I'm on the computer already pulling down the tax records and everything on the property to try and establish what this figure is gonna be. But you try to get a little bit tighter on the number. So we always order a, a CMA, Osborne in our case would do that for us as well. Uh, he charges for those though. So we had an internal pricing structure. So we, we, we get a CMA and then once I got that, I would forward it onto the owner and say, all right, so hypothetically, it says your home's worth 300,000. Do you think you could sell it for us, sell it to us for about 240,000? If they say yes, then we'd say, well, is there a time that we can come out and take a look at the property? And I'd usually grab myself and a rehab or at least a second set of eyes from our organization to go out with me. I know housing decent enough, but I think you always want a couple eyes or a, you know somebody who's a contractor to go through and, and make sure that you're not missing stuff like a big cost item. Go through that, um, and at that point in time, you can at least ballpark what you think the rehab needs are going to be. So maybe the property is worth three hundred thousand. They've agreed to sell it to you for two forty, and let's say you've been able to raise, you've been able to come up with another twenty thousand dollars, but you walk through and you realize you have fifty thousand dollars worth of rehab before you can put this thing back on the market. So it, it creates another opportunity to say, look, I know you talked about the basement wasn't that great of shape, but uh, we we kind of think we got we got to put another. Would you be well, we got twenty thousand dollars that we can come in, but we're still shy of twenty thousand dollars. Would you be willing to sell it to us for two twenty? And that's how we've gotten to forty one percent of the, the sales price. Mm -hmm. It's oftentimes we've needed to leverage additional dollars and, and ask them to go a little bit deeper. If they say, "Yeah, I think conceptually that works," then you flip the switch and you order a full blown appraisal on the property to establish the value. And hopefully, the CMA is pretty darn close to that. But if it's not, then you, then you have that future kind of conversation at it one more time. So there's a lot of back and forth to see if you can land on the purchase price. When you finally do land on that purchase price, you write up the purchase agreement and contained all these conditions and you know, we'll close when you want to, when you want to do that. You know, again, treating this person like a donor. You get to a purchase agreement, you sign it, and you get to close it. Yes? Have you ever had someone pull up and tell them that it's really a money pit? And you haven't been able to get some kind of a something that actually makes sense, or you just go back to your common sense and sound like you can't sell it without money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely is. Um, the importance of raising dollars, I think, is huge. And where we made a mistake was early on that question about the more expensive home. We thought we could, if we could get the seller to discount their price by 20%, and even if there was some rehab, if we just raised a bucket of rehab money, 
we could solve for that. But one of the one of the first homes was a was a great opportunity. It's like three hundred. Oh, that's one of the ones. That one down on Elliott. Uh, it's like three hundred three hundred twenty thousand dollar property. She's willing to discount it by one hundred twenty thousand dollars. So we we wanted to. I think we ended up buying it for about two hundred, but that still was above where we wanted to, and so we. The dollars that we had raised was for rehab. She kept her home in really, really good shape. So we only had maybe like $5,000 of rehab. So that bucket of funds didn't do it for us. And then we, we kind of put our tail between our legs and went back to some other funders, see if we could use some of the, the, the buyer-initiated money that we had raised for this particular purpose. But at that early moment, we realized that, crap, we, need, we either need a combined bucket of funds or we need two funds, two buckets of funding for this particular opportunity because we wanted to get lower in that price. And, we found, we found a way to do it, but it wasn't ideal. And, and from that, we started to say either we're, at, we're asking for collective development gap and affordability gap, or we also we want to make sure that we make that affordability gap. So I don't know if that gets to your question or not, but if it's not going to work, it's not going to work. And I think having, you know, to be able to talk it over with colleagues, to be able to talk it over to say, do we really have the funds? There's always going to be a surprise to it, right? And we know that enough about that in act rehab that there's going to be something five, ten thousand dollar cost that you didn't anticipate. So, kind of thinking through, do we have the flexibility in either our anticipated pricing? All right, we're shooting for 160, but we can make it work at 170 if we get dinged with some sort of a unexpected rehab item to make the numbers still work was was really important. Uh, but then again. If your bucket of funds is deep enough, that you can do a lot with that too. So it's it's this balance point. The key here is not to lose the opportunity, especially if it's a significant leverage point for funding. I mean that's that's golden to be able to say, hey Minnesota Housing, last year we we got over three hundred thousand dollars in private money donated for discounted sales. That's what we're using for projected leverage here. Yeah. Um, do you put any, like, kind of to this idea of, like, if it just didn't work, do you put any clause in there that it's like, you know, I know you want your home to be a land trust home, I know you want it to be permanently affordable, but if for some reason something came up and it didn't, didn't work out, can you sell it on open market? Yeah, so, so right. a lot of times we can't get this far. What the seller needs to, to, to make what it is that it's worth. They got, they got, you know, debt obligations of first and second, whatever the case may be, and they just can't sell it at a discount. That's often when we connected with kind of the buyer side of the organization yep. and say, hey, do you know of anybody that's looking to buy in this neighborhood or in South Minneapolis or North Minneapolis? Julie, who's also in the back of the room, be like, hey, do you know if anybody's looking? And if so, you want to let them know that this property, it's not yet listed. It could be a really good, really could be a good matchup. It still benefits the seller. They might be able to discount it that, that 5% that they would have been paying in real estate fees. That might be enough to facilitate a transaction. Um, again, seeing if Osborne could work with us to help maybe the discounted price, put a purchase agreement together between the seller and the buyer, and, and then that would then we have additional funding from the buyer initiative program that we could bring in and, and, and make the deal work. Or sometimes you just let these things simmer and say, look, I know it's not going to work for you, or you don't, you have, you want, you're exploring other options, but we're there. If you want to have a conversation down the road, let us know. Market conditions change, and just keep that 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 that, that communication open with the, with the potential seller. Yes, sir. Um, we get calls from people who want to discuss this all the time, but many many times their home is not anywhere near the condition. Literally, like we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars if we're talking about it. Um, when you talked it in your first part, you said uh, you have like a program parameter guideline. Is condition, like what were some of the things that you maybe filter on condition that you're just like, hey, if your home doesn't have X, we just thank you for the call, but we're not gonna be coming out. It typically has happened in the rehab portion. Uh, there was one instance where you know, the walls in the basement were probably yeah. you know 60 degree angles and it's like, I don't know if I'm even comfortable Basically, <laughs> there needs to be some serious, you know, probably a hundred thousand dollars worth of, of, of engineering work to even, you know, at that point, is it worth tearing it down? Or, you know, I, I had 
I remember there was one property that it was a total teardown. And I think we were willing to take it knowing that somewhere we could find the money for the demolition, right? Like we were willing to take that loss in exchange for them just donating it outright. And of course they wanted money, so it didn't work. You know, the mm -hmm. numbers don't work at, at some point in time. And we didn't we didn't have any of you know the gap that we needed to build a new home, but it was more kind of from a land banking strategy to be able to do that. Yeah, I was just gonna say in Durham County, we haven't we have like just one sort of exposed Other questions, thoughts? I have a question. Yeah. Jeff. Has any have any organizations here thought about creating more of a a process structure to try to lure more of this by creating that next house product? So, like, I'm thinking of maybe something geared more towards seniors. So, like, there's a lot of seniors that are living in two, four, five bedroom homes paid off, um, these are great workforce um, income, you know, housing, but these seniors, they don't just want to go and buy a four or $500,000 patio home or something like that. Is there thoughts out there about, you know, building something that could be a pipeline? Yeah, so my ex-colleague Stacy, I think in the last session today is talking about, um, what do we call it, a project sustained legacy. And that's the program where uh, you know, homeowners who need to either do some rehab to their home or maybe got into a debt situation, the land trust comes in, solves for the debt problem in exchange for them deeding over the land. They still stay in the home and it's part of the land trust. So she's doing a session on that. But also I think it's worth uh, noting um, the homes within reach folks, so the, the kind of the Minnetonka group, for lack of better terms. Uh, the city of Edina um, was giving existing homeowners, often elderly, folks who own single family homes in, in this very wealthy community. I think they were up providing up to $50,000 for um, right of first refusal to the city to sell their properties. And then the city also had some funding that they were gonna to work with homes within reach to bring those homes into the land trust. So I think increasingly like, cities recognize that there's, there's folks in the community, there's these limited parcels, um, uh, so how do you take advantage of um, helping somebody stay in, stay in their home, but if and when they want to sell, that there's a right to kind of purchase that property and bring it into the land trust? Yeah, Alex. I was just going to share one of our examples. Of yeah. Like this bill went really well. Is we had, I'm in Oakland, the Oakland City County Land Trust. We had someone in Berkeley who owned a condo that was worth about $900,000. And obviously, we're not going to take over condos. An HOA and all that stuff ended up with the city. So we ended up selling the condo, took the proceeds from that. Uh, Kaiser Hospital donated two properties to us. Uh, one was worth about 900 to a million, the other one was worth about 5 million. And we put the 900,000 in the rehab for those. And now we're selling those 328 and probably, I mean, these are all open numbers. I yeah, no, no. It... But, um, but yeah, we were able to leverage condo sale that was not going to be appropriate for our ownership to then rehab other homes and sell it out. They're, they're Oakland home numbers today, but I think the things, you know, especially here in the, you know, the upper Midwest is those, those are our numbers at some point in time. And so to think about what can we continue to do today? How do we sell the future of what's happening on the West Coast on what's happening on the East Coast? Um, you know, we're going to lag behind, but those, those figures are going to be here. I never thought, I never thought that we'd be selling homes in the price range that we are in Minneapolis. And that, that's only a 20 year horizon here. So I, you know, I, it, it wouldn't surprise me to, to start to see, you know, they're just pulling into the high sixes into the low sevens and, and us having to, to grapple with that and kicking ourselves that we didn't do more today because while a hundred thousand feels like a crazy amount of money that you have to raise per unit, 
it's just going to be a drop in the bucket of what Alex is dealing with now, right? Like I, that's a uh, huge. <laughs> right? Like what? What could we do with four hundred thousand per unit here? Right? Like I, I think. Uh, yeah. Very very instrumental. Other thoughts? Yeah, I saw somebody else's hand. Yeah. eventually one sonification. So if he came in and they say, well, you know, we have a lot of restrictions on what we can do with this. So that is one of the problems. The second is that we don't have the money to buy it. But it's such a great opportunity in our small city because we don't have an open canvas. We don't have many lots that we can say we can build on it. And so we are dependent on those owners that want to sell. So I just wanted to put this out for there. I don't know if anybody has gone through something like that and what would be options or, or ideas. I know it's a great opportunity for a CLP that has money to buy it to right. jump into it, but what, what do you do when you don't have Thoughts? Anyone? Again, it's one of those situations where I think Money and access to to cash uh, make a huge difference, and our ability to do this really was was partly only possible because we had evolved over 20 years, and we we you know we had built up our balance sheet. We have access to cash and lines of credit and a whole bunch of things that allowed us to move quickly. And I think it's it, it's easy to say something like this and realize that if you're a young organization. You just don't have that access to capital or debt the way that you do once your balance sheet be, builds up. And so having those conversations with lenders, uh, somebody here from, you know, from Bremer, I mean, early on, to the credit of the Bremer Bank, you know, we banked with them and <laughs> we, we had no assets. And um, they went on a limb and I think they gave us a hundred, initially a $100,000 line of credit. But this is 20 years ago, but it was... It was it was on nothing. It was on you know the filing cabinets and on the few computers they were leveraging that 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 line of credit to us on that. Which you know credit to to Bremer for doing that for us, but it was a slow process of then going to two hundred thousand and then we and then we had a building and then they're like oh we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna secure this loan against the building which is fine, but but you know it was like it was a process to build up that access to cash that I think put us in a position where we could we could have these conversations and have the luxury of. You know, I drove, drove finance director nuts. You know, I like be like, all right, Molly, we're, we're buying this home next week. Make sure the money's there, and then she has to figure out to, to make sure the funds are in in place. But that's a, that's a luxury I did not have for the first fifteen years of working at the organization. That only that only happened in the last five. Yes, Dakota. Yeah, Corey. I guess it's a, I, I um, work on community land trust, but I'm, I'm also a funder, and I, I would say um, if you're not aware, many of the larger foundations, like you know, these things called programs of angel investment, is it's it's a way to get access to typically zero or two percent money. Sometimes you can figure out terms where it stays zero percent until you use it, and then you can work with your funder to to put together something. So it's not a grant; it's something you got to pay back. But you get that flexible access. We had an experience early, I mean, after the, the Bremer, I think the next kind of access to cash that we had is out of the blue, 
um, some small family family foundation. I remember, if you know St. Paul, there's an avenue called Summit, Ave Summit Avenue, and there's a bunch of really nice big homes on Summit Avenue. And they said, we, we'd like you to come over uh, and, and talk about maybe some sort of um, benefit to you. And so I drove down, you know, in my junky car, Summit Avenue, get out and walk into one of these big mansions. And big, I remember it was just a huge table and, and sitting around the table with mom and dad. And then it was kind of the son about my age who was more of the philanthropist in the family. It was clearly parents' money. But they said, you know, we'd be willing to make, a, I think the terms were a three-year PRI at 2%. Um, so I said, sure, that works. Um, and, but we, revolt, we, we renewed that a couple of years in a row, and they were really, really, that, that money was really critical to us to just give us that money. And yes, we, we paid the 2% or 1%, maybe it was 1%, it was decent money, but that really helped us from a cash perspective too, just to have table money. I mean, so often I think you're, 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 as you do a transaction, you're waiting for reimbursements. And, and you, I, you know, the dollars today, I think increasingly, you're needing close to a million dollars to, to, to facilitate a couple transactions at any given time. And so, yeah, there are people that have money, right? And they, they still want to make money on that money. But if you can get the money at a, at a low enough interest rate, or ideally no interest rate, then, then that's, that's golden to help kind of the production side of the organization. Yeah. Don't get discouraged, right? Like that's the thing. It's really easy for a, a mature organization to get up here and be like, well, what you need to do is build your balance sheet to $30 million. And then when you do that, you, you take a portion of that and you leverage that further and you got all this other money. To, like, no. I, I remember the days where I didn't know if we'd be able to pay, make payroll, right? Like those are very real things as you're getting going. But, but know that if you keep focusing on the mission, you keep leaning into this, good things are gonna pop over time. And then when they do, take them and leverage them forward. And, and, and it, time and time again, you see that playing out. It just takes time and it takes focus and leaning into this stuff. So on to fun, form 8283, IRS. I knew nothing about this three years ago. Um, and I am no tax attorney. Uh, but, or accountant, um, but it's a pretty simple form. The, I made a copy of this, this will be uploaded too, and I tried to populate the few lines that you need to populate as the organization. I think one of the benefits, and, and oftentimes these folks have either an accountant or attorney that you're working with, so I didn't share this, is that some of your interface might be in a three-way call. It may be on a Zoom call with a, a number of people. And so to know enough about this, to to never ever proclaim that you're the expert on it, but just to be familiar with it, I think is really, really important. Um, making sure that when you're communicating with the appraiser early on, that this, share this form with them if they're not familiar with it, to make sure that they know what they're looking at as well. Um, and because they, they need to do a full blown appraisal, it can't be, and at the CLCLT, we, we often order appraisal and we just, oh, what's, a, uh, what's the term for a simple, Restricted, a restricted appraisal. Yeah, so there's a way that, you know, appraisers can kind of do just a short form appraisal. They, they go through a limited amount of methodology. And for us, it was a, a much cheaper appraisal. The, the figure was good enough for us. Lenders require this unrestricted, full-blown appraisal. And that's the appraisal that you're going to need for, from a valuation perspective to satisfy the IRS. So, so don't take the cheap route. Uh, order the full-blown appraisal. And increase it. And if you can find an appraiser that's willing to do it at a reasonable cost, then go that way. I mean, appraisals, as we all know, are six, seven hundred bucks now. So I think we were able to get, we had an appraiser that was able to do the full blown appraisal for us for maybe 300 or 400 bucks. But that's still, that's an outlay of cash that this may or may not work out. And you got to be willing to make kind of that, that investment on the front end. 
if you want this to work out, or if you can convince the seller uh, to pick up the cost of that if you're if you're if you're in a tough financial place. But you know, basically, it's that. And then the two things that you're going to have to figure out from the seller is when they bought that property and how much did they pay for it. Typically, you can get that information from the internet, but if you can get it from them, as well as what, you know, I've done. I made this mistake. You know, I, I got the name. I pulled it off of, you know, the, the property tax records. But that's not the same name that they use in filing their property taxes. So if you can get that information in the conversation, just to populate as much of this as possible before you send it over to them, I think is really helpful. Ultimately, once you get that final appraisal, you'll plug in that figure. You'll figure out what the donated amount is because you'll have the purchase agreement, and you want to have all this stuff ready at, for closing as well, with your organizational signature on it and the appraiser signature on it, and that's that's what's handed over. There have been times I messed it up, and then I have to do it again and send it over to them and get another signature. But it's it is I think something that's beneficial to the the, the seller. They can claim. Um, the, the, the donated amount, the difference between the appraised value and what they sold it to you for over the next five years, however they choose to do so. They're, so if they're, they're a family or a household of means, they're often in conversation with their accountant on how best to structure that. But your end of the deal is just to get this form to them, and then they can do with it what they want to. Yeah. No, I think most of the time, you know, they have a hyper uh, inflated value in, in you know, like this home is the best house in the city of Minneapolis and it's worth lots of money. And then you're like, you know, Osborne, are you sure this is all this is worth? Because I don't want to have this conversation. They think it's worth 500 and I'm now going to break the news to them that every home in their neighborhood is only selling for 300,000, right? Like that's, that's the, the tougher conversation I feel like I've had with folks. And I'm like, well, maybe the appraisal will come in higher. And then, of course, the appraisal comes in lower. And then you're dealing with the, the second disappointing news to the, to the seller, right? Like, that's our lives. It's just disappointing folks at a rate that they can accept. Yep. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. But again, it doesn't cost you to have this tool in your toolbox to promote it. You never know when a conversation is going to be there. I, I, and I, I think there's some, some, some bullet points up here just to incorporate that into the culture of the conversation, especially if you're the head of the organization and you're out talking with realtors, lenders, you're talking with... Um, foundation people who maybe have donor advised funds, like talking about it all the time. Here, here are different program offerings within the City Lakes Community Land Trust, and this is one of them. You talk about it as a program, as a way to raise dollars for your organization and as a way to bring homes into your community land trust and create an opportunity for folks to buy homes. Best practices. Um, all right, again, the one page document, up to date. Uh, something like this document that kind of lays out the process, I think would have been really, really helpful. You have the conversation with, with the potential donator and you're like, I'm gonna follow up, I'm gonna send you a little bit of information on our organization and then I have a one page document I'm gonna send to you that kind of lays out all the things that we talked about. So they have it for the records, if they need to send it to an attorney, if they need to send it to um, uh, their accountant, everybody's on the same page about what the expectations are and what the process is gonna look like. Um, Got to have a real estate partner who's willing to help you out. I don't think you have to, but I think you're, it, it definitely helps in the conversation if you can put that on the table as a benefit to the transaction. Um, ask them to refrain from uh, uh, enlisting a, a realtor on their side. Because a lot of times I had those conversations like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm already, you know, I already signed a listing agreement with this agent. And you're like, ugh. Because that person's now going to want to get paid, and that 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 got, cuts into your sales pitch a little bit when you have to talk about that thing. When does that listing agreement end? Like, let's maybe have this conversation. If you if your home doesn't sell, when when's the listing agreement end? Let's have that conversation after it's end because I think this is an, a viable approach that's going to also maybe potentially uh, get you to a, a sale quicker, uh, especially if it's in a tough market. Um, 
and then encourage them to sell or, or to, to, to pay for their share of the closing, closing costs. Some more best practices. Um, if they have to, the, that Tish thing, truth and sale of housing, if you have that in your community, I mean, we, we paid for some of those. It's just one more step because you, you got to order and then you got to coordinate times and, and all that kind of stuff. If the seller is willing to do it, in, in 300, 400 bucks in Minneapolis, um, it's a lot easier to just ask them to do it. If they put up a stink, pay for it and deal with it, at least in our case. Get, get familiar with this form. Um, have at least one good appraiser. I think it's always good to have a couple good appraisers in your pocket if you can get them, um, that you can call on them and ask them to do the side work. A lot of times they're so busy, they're so booked out, and part of the, the part of the opportunity here is to be able to move quickly. And so if you can lean hard on a couple appraisers that, that you have a good relationship with, uh, then it really helps the whole process if you know that you can get them out within a week or two to, to, to do an appraisal on a property. Um, keep a running list of these opportunities. So one of the things I did was I invested in a whiteboard and I put it up in my office. In each one of these conversations, I'd put up there just so that I had a constant reminder that these things are kind of in play. And, and so, I don't know, if I didn't hear from somebody for three or four months and they were thinking about it, like you have this conversation, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. So just to call, just like somebody's like, I'm thinking about making a donation to your organization. Are you gonna let that go forever and ever and ever? No, so make a list, make sure that you, you make time some week, carve out an hour, plug it into my calendar and say, make these darn calls. Reach out to folks and say, hey, where are you at? What's going on? What, what are you learning? Just to, it, at the very least, you might win a, an individual donor for the organization down the road if, if you just keep talking about your organization um, and show that you're a good organization. And it may be, you know, 100 bucks a year, 200 bucks a year, but that, you never know where that turns into. And that, you know, this isn't an individual fundraising session, but, but I think all this stuff leads to good stewardship of the organization and good stewardship of, of, of potential donors as well. Um, but you don't want to do that every day either, like just harass somebody. So it's this balance point between, you know, just, hey, what's it going? It's checking in on you. And a lot of times they're like, oh, yeah, I sold it or I got a purchase agreement. And take them off the list. And, yeah. A good appraiser. <laughs> you know, that could probably be a whole other presentation, but when it comes to um, working with appraisals, at the end of the day, the appraiser ends up with a range, right? He's got all these comps, and he ends up with a range, and he probably lands somewhere in the middle. Have you found a best practice to steer appraisers any certain direction on that range? I've never pushed on it. Um, I sometimes lead into it and say, we did a CMA on it and it came in at this figure. Uh, uh, and if they know about kind of this approach like ours did, I was like, hey, this is a potential, this is kind of where we landed. And, and I, my, my sense with appraisers, the more you push them, the more they, 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 they lock themselves into their position or um, are tougher to move. So it's like, you do your thing. All I can do is inform you with information I have and, and not push too hard on, on kind of influencing that. Um, I think there probably are ways to say, you know, it'd be great if this thing came in at 400,000 or 200,000 or whatever the case may be, but they can do with that what they want. Yeah, I, it's just fresh in my mind. We had a few transactions recently where we're the seller, you know, and we're obviously selling it at the land trust price, but they're, fee simple appraisal felt a little high and we've had them dial it back so it's probably the best. Mom. Yeah. I, I think we've we've seen some of those conversations or I think more important the other approach is just bringing up a you know it, maybe it wasn't in the comp range but it was just outside of a distance that they may have looked for a comp to point to another transaction that happened that was very similar and say, would you be willing to throw this into the mix and, and just see where that goes? And I think it, it, it I mean, there, there have been adjustments over time. It's just not a strategy that I, I think I leaned heavily on to, to get my way. And then don't, don't, don't let perfect get in the way of the good, right? Like these are good opportunities for the organization. And 
sometimes we just jumped into the water and we didn't know how deep it was um, and it all worked out. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out as well as you want, but big, big picture, you, you gained another permanently affordable home in your community. And again, if you're doing enough of them, then, then you can, on average, make the whole thing work out okay from a financial perspective. Again, this comes from a, a position of an organization that was, you know, seeing 30, 30 to 40 closings a year consistently. And you win some, you lose some, some of them you don't get to pay yourself, other ones you do okay on. And, and it, it, over time, you just put the mission out there and hope that it all works out. How to market, uh, share examples. You know, so they, they don't want to be the first one. So say, yeah, we, there was this home, this, exp you know, this person was able to discount their home by 40% and it worked out really, really well. It was a similar situation to yours. So be able to build on it and have those examples to be able to talk about in those initial conversations, I think gives the potential donor a sense of what the range is and where the opportunities might exist. Uh, constantly talking about the program, just like in fundraising, as I was sharing, that this is a fundraising strategy. This is, this is $100,000 less potentially that you don't have to ask the state or the city or the county for because you're getting a private donation that's helping lead toward another unit. Um, make sure that all your colleagues in the office are aware that you are the point person. That any of these calls come in, let me know immediately so I can get back to them. This is really important stuff. Um, this is another one of our tools. As we talk about the different ways that we help folks in the land trust home ownership, one of the ways we're able to do that is through this program. Um, make space on your website for it. Put it out there. You never know when somebody's going to click on this page or you want to refer somebody to it and just say, oh, yeah, there's more information about this on our website. Um, as we, we talked about before, share the program with realtors, attorneys, county property officials. Um, and then talk about the legacy and the leverage over time. You know, I, you know at some point, you know, you, your organization may lose a, a, a home back to the market. But... Until then, it's pretty cool to be able to say, we've never lost a home back to the market. We're keeping the, all these properties in the community land trust. Um, the model's working. We've seen 120 resales or whatever the number is. And, and this is how this thing works. Um, invite them to talk to somebody who maybe has benefited from purchasing a home through your organization. Like You're just trying to draw them in and make the case and, and, and make the case why they're, they're willing to maybe drop another 5% on what they'd accept or gain another 5% on that, that gap of between the appraisal and, and then the, the purchase price from the land trust. Yeah. No, this is how we're going to make this program better is by doing things like that. No, we didn't. Um, yeah, I mean, we stumbled into this and, and, and realized that there's something there. Um, how do you start to incorporate into the organization? And I think some of these next, this, the, the next evolution is to say, how do you put this out there to the public? Um, how do you couple the legacy aspect of the community land trust, the multiple generations of buyers, not just the one-time investment to the organization? I think there's something there. I mean, I look at it and it's like, yeah, I'm, I guarantee the City of Lakes Community Land Trust is going to benefit one way or another from the home I own when I, when I pass, right? It's going to be some sort of benefit, and I, I hope to be in a place where I could say, my kids are doing fine, and they're going to get the home, and good luck doing whatever maintenance is left on the property, but it's yours to deal with and do good with it, right? Like that, I think there's a lot of people in our communities, and you don't have to be in Minneapolis, any of our communities are thinking about what's the legacy I can leave and, and can I do so in a way that can do good for my family and do, do good for the community. Um, I think just look into yourself. I mean, we're all investing time in this and if you, if you had the ability to leave a portion of what you have to, to the organization that you spend a bit of time to, yeah. But I think there's a lot of people out there that, that aren't connected to the land trust that wanna see the community be a better place for their kids and their kids' kids and their kids' kids' kids, kids right? And, and the one way to get there is by not only leaving money to your kids, because they may not do as good of a job as the land trust is in, in making sure that multiple generations of buyers are going to be able to get into home ownership or rental, whatever the case may be. That might be it. Oh, no. Benefits. All right.
All right, so a lot of things we've, we've kind of talked about. Um, benefits, even if it doesn't work out, there might be an opportunity for a donation. We've talked about that, just the relationship building there. Um, so for a significant portion of the overall project. Yeah, so again, kind of from a performer perspective, if, if, if you come into the equation, let's say that it's probably worth 300000 but the, 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 the performer pencils out at $360,000, but you're still solved for 60000 of it through this donation, it, it just lessens the amount that you need to go out and raise from other buckets of funding to make the deal work. Um, the opportunity, existing property, you know, in my eyes, ACK Rehab is cheaper than new construction. A buyer-driven program is cheaper than ACK Rehab or, or, or new construction. Some of these other ways are, are even cheaper than that. From How do you get from a starting point to a sale to a lower-income household? I think often is by kind of what is the, where do you get the most bang for the buck? And, and, it, and it doesn't start with new construction. I think it, it's, it starts with some scrappiness and opportunities like this. Um, how do you break into a neighborhood you otherwise would never have been able to? And I think a lot of it is through an opportunity like this as well. Um, solves to timing. You know, sometimes people just want to be done with it. They don't want to. They don't want to deal with a realtor. They don't want to have to deal with staging their home. They don't want to have to deal with fixing the stupid leaky faucet or toilet that's been plaguing them for years. If you can just say you're going to buy it as is, that's one less thing I have to worry about. And 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 I think. Um, this approach does uh, create some some efficiencies in the timing of that. Um, and then the word of mouth. You talk about this enough. Even if you you weren't able to make a deal work with somebody, they may be talking to somebody else who's looking at selling their home, and they're talking about it. And then those referrals do happen, and I think a number of those that came my way were, were because of that. So to happen quickly, uh, it complements other programs. Again, you have a, a full or a growing portfolio of programs within your organization. Um, demonstrates a creative private sector leverage. Um, potentially eliminates realtor fees for the seller um, and the, the, the donation over time. And it can work in any community. Like this isn't just a Minneapolis phenomenon. I think this can work in a rural community. It can work in an urban setting. It can work in a multi-city kind of situation. It's just about making the connection, letting people know that this is an opportunity. Yeah. I, we had this up on our website before we did any of these. I, I didn't know how to respond. If somebody called me, I'd be like, well, all right. I, I, like, but if Habitat's doing it, we should definitely be doing it, right? Like, that was, I'm a simpleton. Like, I don't think much beyond that, but it felt like we should at least have this up on our website. And if the opportunity presented itself, we'll figure it out, right? Um, again, don't let perfect get in the way of the good. And, and, and like, People aren't going to do it if they don't know that it exists and that you're willing to do it. And, and if it required me at some future point to get on the phone, value the property may force some organizational decisions. We talked about that. And then, you know, somebody calls and, like, I, I, you know, I think my home is great. And you all should want this in your land trust. You're not even appreciative of this opportunity I'm giving you kind of conversation. And I think being okay that, that some folks, like, you mean you can't take 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 percent and being able to say, look, We've really been successful. There's a lot of people out there. Um, we've, 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 we've sold this to our funders uh, that we're always going to get at least a 20% benefit. And it's not to say what you're doing isn't it's hugely generous. Maybe we can hook you up with a buyer-initiated program, and you can discount your property by 10% through that program. But this program is really set up for at least our threshold, which was at 20%. And, you know, and 20% was just a figure that we put out there. If, if you can. Make it work at 25 or 30 percent. Go for it. Do it and share it with this group because I think that's the way that we can we can all do better. Uh, lessons learned. I encourage them to not enlist a realtor if this is something that they're interested in potentially pursuing. Uh, I talked about the need to raise both affordability and development gap dollars. 
Um, <laughs> be prepared to spend time listening to their story. Uh, explain the process and engaging attorneys and accountants. Uh, who, and we all speak different languages than those folks. Uh, set aside funds. We talked about that. Oh, and, and at least for us, we've had our asses handed to us more than a dozen times on having to repair sewer lines, right? Like cracked an old infrastructure in Minneapolis, and that's just like writing a $10,000 check that you didn't need to do. So do the scope, build it in, and if you can help negotiate down a lower price that you're gonna buy it for, do that, because if not, it, you know, I don't know, one out of 10 times we buy our property, we're, we're doing some, some significant sewer line repair, uh, maybe, maybe more often than that. And, and so do spend the, you know, three, four, 500 bucks it, it takes to scope it and make sure that you're in good shape. The other thing is if you don't do it and then it cracks the next year, that homeowner you sold it to is gonna be coming after you hard. And then you're gonna to have to pay or do something a year from then when you definitely don't have any money. So make sure to do at least this one. Especially if you, if you have, you know, frost lines that, that dip below four foot and cracking things. Um, negotiate who'll be paying for the tish. Talked about that. Details, if any, what will remain in the home. I, I, this happened to us. Like, oh, I have this beautiful couch and, and there's all this other stuff. And all of a sudden you're like, now we got to pay for a container because we don't want this and nobody else wants it. Or you snapping pictures of stuff and putting it out to people and it just takes a lot of time and energy. So making sure what, what they're going to leave in the property, uh, if it's a home that has, you know, items in it. Um, understand the level of recognition desired. Some folks don't want any recognition. Others are like, we really want to invite all the neighbors to an open house. Are you all willing to do that? So make sure that you're, you, you know what their expectations are if you need to be putting on events and those kinds of things. Retain copies of everything. Uh, more than a number of times, Folks that sold to us came back and said, oh, yeah, do you have a copy of that, that, that IRS form? And so just make sure that you keep copies of everything. And it's not closed until it's closed. Manage your expectations. Some of these things will fall through after you've put in a bunch of time and paid for appraisals and got all kinds of contractors lined up only for it to not to happen. And so to be able to, to manage your own expectations. But overall, as you could hopefully here for me, I, I think that this is really, really an important component for land trust to have. Um, and I think maybe the lesson I learned today is, you know, make sure that you have cash and or access to some affordability gap or development gap funds before you jump into this water. But aside from that, you know, kind of build this in. And, and if you need examples to leverage, I think reach out to the City Lakes Community Land Trust, but it also sounds like a number of other organizations here have had some successes. So to be able to point to where it has worked, I think is critical and uh, um, it's, it's definitely, you know, probably half a million dollars, if not more, worth of benefit has gone to the City Lakes Community Land Trust over just the last three years in, in uh, donated amounts of funding. I'm taking you right up to the end. I actually were a minute over. So any, any other comments? Thank you for your time. For folks that did not get, I made copies of stuff, but I'll, I'll make sure that those will be part of the packet uh, that will be uploaded to a Google Doc next week. Uh, when we're done with this. Thank Thanks.